Hebrew University Computer Science Department and um, founder of DAG Labs. So, our DAG based protocols novel. Um, first, a DAG is directed to a cyclic graph of blocks, something like that. And a, a nice Twitter intrigued me to, um, to pick the title for this talk. Someone um, tweeted, a directed acyclic graph is a data stru structure, not a kind of proof of work. This is the right part. Um, it's used in Git, dating from 2005, and comes from long before that. It is not novel, notable, or exciting. Um, so as a co-author of, of some DAG-based protocols, I was intrigued to, to uh, dive, dive into this uh, deeper. There's also, so, so there's wide misconception in the community about what DAGs are. This is not the only uh, uh, tweet. There's also some um, uh, video of Andreas, a very respected fellow, which criticizes DAGs, but really criticizes other systems. So usually when people hear in our community about DAGs, they associated it with um, some ideas, like, um, let me just put it full view. Some ideas like, um, block ledgers that do not have blocks, ledgers that do not have miners, um, getting rid of proof of work, the notion that somehow users uh, should or can mine their own transactions, um, the notion that uh, we, ha can ha we can ma maintain um, a system without, um, where, where, where users don't pay fees for operating transactions. Pause a moment. Anyways, so, yeah, we're good? Oh, thanks. We'll see if it interfaces. I can't make sure that. Green light, green light. Chances are it will work. <laughs> There's the event. That, that's a blackout, so don't press that. Cool. So this is a very important uh, uh, message uh, for me. All these ideas, which, um, might be good ideas or bad ideas, you can probably guess my sentiments toward them, are not related to DAGs. They're just, by mere coincidence, some protocols that you might heard have, such, such as, let's say, Byteball or other protocols, they incidentally used both the notion of DAGs and these notions somehow combined. And therefore, when you hear about DAGs in our community, you usually hear about these stuff. And when Andreas uh, criticizes DAGs, uh, uh, rightly so, he criticizes these ideas, OK? In truth, DAGs are about something else. It's just a data structure, merely a data structure, a generalization of Satoshi's chain. And the reason we're using these, these data structures is to solve the scale, one of the scalability challenges, namely the orphan rate problem. Okay, so if you want to scale the blockchain, let's say we want 10 blocks per second, let's exaggerate, then there are several problems, several barriers we meet. Um, disk I.O., RAM, storage, bootstrapping, and syncing new nodes. Many, many barriers to scalability. One of them is the orphan rate. And if we can, you know, in a healthy system, the network is the bottleneck, because processing computer is something that we can uh, control, optimize, but not, we can't control the network. So if we can scale the system to a level where the network will become the, the bottleneck and the propagation delay will be a problem, then orphan rates will be the main barrier and DAGs are, are um, a, uh, a data structure and a protocol family that may, uh, may help to solve it, okay? So if you don't think the orphan rate will be a problem, if you think we'll never meet the barrier where 
propagation delay is interesting, then DAGs are not interesting. Okay. The last point to, uh, to, um, to, to make sure we understand is that DAGs introduce a new problem to the system. If you incorporate all blocks, we need somehow to recover the consistency. So chains are consistent by definition, and DAGs are not. In more detail, so let's compare DAGs and chains and what are the novel parts of these data structure. So, so actually the data structure is not novel. It's totally trivial. A chain is totally trivial, it's just a linked list. And a DAG is totally trivial. It wasn't used in 2005, it was used like um, maybe uh, hundreds of years ago already. Um, it's not an interesting data structure in and of itself. The only part which may or may not be novel in a DAG-based system is a consensus protocol. Okay, like in, like in Satoshi's system, the chain is the least part that is interesting. The interesting part of Satoshi's system is the consensus protocol, the way he figured out how to um, arrive at consensus in a permissionless setting. Okay, the way Satoshi arrived at consensus is by specifying a chain selection rule. Specifying what, what is the chain that should be considered the valid state of the ledger. And this chain is, again, consistent by construction. Every block is consistent with, his, with history. Um, in contrast, in a DAG, we incorporate all blocks, so the consensus uh, mechanism will look differently. It will look as a, a uh, rule to order blocks, to say what the order over blocks is. I'll, I'll give an example shortly. Okay, so imagine we have, again, um, we have a DAG, and this is the block A to your left is the genesis block, and times flows, time flows from the left to right. So let's say we have this DAG, and we have transaction two in, um, in, in block G, transaction one in block F, and they conflict. Okay? So these, both of these blocks, nonetheless, should be incorporated into the ledger, assuming the proof of work was solved in a valid manner, the difficulty um, was updated, etc. Okay, so a moment. So here, it, it could be that temporarily, two miners have different worldviews. Temporarily, like in Bitcoin. Let's say I mined a block, I didn't um, uh, send it to you yet, uh, or it's propagating in the network. For a few seconds, it might be that uh, you think that there's one chain and I know about a different chain. So if the client here, um, let's say uh, miner one, wants to, uh, calculates the probability that transaction two will not be accepted eventually, he will get a very large number. He will get something, of course I invented this number, but something like uh, uh, 0.91 probability of that one transaction will be rejected. So when, when a client sees this, this state, he refrains from accepting the transaction until additional confirmations will accumulate, exactly like we have in Bitcoin, right? When you see a, a transaction with one confirmation, and it's a sensitive transaction, you refrain from accepting it until further uh, confirmations. And then, when time grows, more blocks are added to the ledger, and all miners acknowledge all blocks that they see, so the miner of block I received full information on EFG, block H only viewed block, block G, and then you see that the probability that transaction two will not be accepted um, decreases. Now it's uh, 0.76. And as time develops, the probability that transaction two will be rejected goes uh, to zero. Okay, so again, the process is you see a transaction in the block ledger, it begins with being susceptible to reorgs, then you calculate, um, as time develops, you see more and more confirmations. You see that these confirmations um, dictate that, let's say in this example, that G precedes F, and then you accept the transaction uh, as secure. Okay, so again, this is like Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, there's temporarily disagreements, temporary disagreements between nodes in the network, but after a short while, um, these disagreements reconcile, these worldviews reconcile. Okay, so there are several block DAG protocols. 
um, um, we uh, in the Hebrew University um, came up with um, two recent uh, uh, two block deck protocols. Um, one Spectre um, in the end of 2016, and Phantom. It's a recent protocol, and this is joint work with my advisor at the Hebrew University, Aviv Zohar. Okay. So as you see, this is a proof-of-work-based algorithm. It's not inventing anything new other than the modifying the data structure. Okay, so how do we think uh, in Phantom, what are, what's our approach towards the DAG? The first thing we observe is if this is a typical DAG, then blocks will be um, typically connected to almost all the DAG. Okay, so for instance, block E, this block here on the top, he's connected either as an ancestor or as a descendant to all blocks apart from um, block B and G, right? These two blocks, B and G, are not connected to block E, uh, neither as descendants nor as ancestors. But for every honest block, there will be at most K, K such blocks. Okay, it can't, if you look only at uh, the honest miners, the typical behavior of the system, you will see that most blocks are connected to almost all blocks. And the nice thing about K is that we can reason about its, 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 uh, its value. So we can say, for instance, if there are uh, 10 blocks per second, and the network propagation is uh, 10, 10 seconds, then K will be roughly 200. This is the back of the envelope calculation. I won't get into details, but you see, you set the throughput that you want. Let's say you want the network to support um, 10 blocks per second, and you have some upper bound on a propagation delay, then you can derive K a priori. Okay, so here, here's how it looks in a more general setup. So we saw in K equals two at the top right, most blocks are connected, uh, connected to most blocks apart from at most two blocks. When you scale up the system significantly, you have this massive DAG here, K equals 10. Every block here is connected to all blocks apart from at most 10 blocks. And obviously you can see that the longest chain here won't, rule won't work, right? Most of, if, if you accept only the longest chain, most of the blocks will be discarded. And at the top, you can see what happens when you set K to zero. So when the propagation, when the, uh, propagation delay is very negligible relative to the block creation time, and this happens in Bitcoin because the block is created only once in 10 minutes. So when, propagation delay, when block creation rate is very small, is very low, you don't have natural uh, spontaneous forks in the network, and so K equals zero. Okay? K equals zero means all blocks are connected to everyone at, at typical behaviors. Of course, typical behavior is not what we aim at analyzing. We want to understand how a manipulation of an attacker looks like. But before we can discuss this, we need to understand that DAGs are not uh, arbitrary in, in proof of work system. DAGs will not look arbitrarily weird. We will see some um, order, some pattern, and the pattern is well connectedness up to a parameter of k. Okay. So let's take k equals two for simplicity. We have here the typical behavior when everyone is honest, but what happens when someone starts, uh, tries to manipulate our DAG? So how will the manipulation look like? The most simple manipulation will look like this. So here, the minor of blocks B, D, G, for some reason, decided to disconnect from the DAG, and he does so by not, con not pointing, not referencing uh, previous blocks. So for instance, um, we saw that block D, um, the miner of block D received already block C because he, he referenced it in the previous setup. But now the miner decides to avoid acknowledging block C and instead omit this link. And likewise, omit the links from D, G to F. So we have this uh, attack. And here it's very clear to us who the attacker is who the honest faction is. Right? It's very clear that, that if we count the proof of work, and here we explicitly use the fact that we're using proof of work, and the attacker has less than a majority, then it's clear that C, E, F, H, I 
were mined with most uh, likelihood by the honest faction, and BDG were mined by the attacker. And we can use this reasoning to say, OK, we will somehow penalize BDG for this attack. We won't let them cut in line. We won't let them harm us. Um, with that, there are more sophisticated attacks. I won't get uh, in too much, into too much details about how does, do other attacks looks like, look like, but some links can be missing. Some other setups can be, in other setups, the other links are missing. It requires uh, going through uh, lots of examples to understand how the attacker can manipulate the DAG. But the bottom line is we want to understand and reason in an algorithmic manner. Use, uh, the, the protocol gets and gets, uh, views a DAG and needs to decide with high probability which, is, which blocks were mined by honest uh, miners, which blocks were mined by an attacker. Namely, which, which blocks are well connected to the DAG, which blocks are uh, disconnected from the DAG. Okay, so here are a few examples. This is again the, the most trivial example, but there are other examples where you can see, for instance, in the top right, that block B um, is disconnected from C, E, F, um, and also I from C, E, F, and I, and these are under a certain assumptions on K, this is too low, this is too high. I mean, there's too many um, blocks that he's missing, and therefore we're coloring him, we're coloring this block as a red block, as an attacker block. There are several examples, and what's the rule? Yeah, so before we get to the rule, um, Observe that this agenda of recognizing who is an attacker, who is an honest block, is merely a generalization of Satoshi's paradigm. So what Satoshi did is he looked at a tree of chains. There's, there's many forks, right? Or not many. There, there are forks in the network. And Satoshi said, if you want to recognize the honest set of blocks, you should choose to select the, the longest chain. So the rule of thumb in Satoshi of Satoshi is longest chain equals honest chain. And this works when the network uh, propagation delay is negligible. And we want to generalize it, and we want to say, OK, so in general, in DAGs, how will this look like? How will Satoshi's paradigm generalize over two DAGs? So to converge on our protocol, what our protocol actually is, Let's introduce a, a short definition, a formal definition. A K cluster is a set of blocks. Here, they're den denoted uh, marked with blue color. A set of blocks which are well connected in the DAG. What do I mean by well connected? Every block is either an ancestor or a descendant of all blue blocks apart from at most K. So for instance, you see block E here is in the blue set, and he's disconnected only from D and H. Right? E has AB as ancestor, ancestors FKLM as descendants, and I as descendants is only disconnected from D and H, so only from two. Block F is only disconnected from H and I. All the rest of blocks are either ancestors of F or descendants. But block J, for instance, has many, many blocks he is not connect it is not connected to in the, in the blue set, okay? Therefore, we mark block J as a red block. OK, so let's, let's give another example, block C. Block C is disconnected from many, many blocks, from B, E, D, F, H. It is disconnected. Um, therefore, he, it, is a, it is a red block. It's an attacker block. It is, a, it, it is not in our K cluster. Um, but block B, for instance, is connected to all blue blocks. So it, it is in the blue set. It is in our K cluster. Um, and the Phantom Protocol uh, conceptually says, pick the, lar the largest K cluster, and this will be your honest set of blocks. So given a DAG, you don't know what happened there. You don't know really, um, you know, uh, the attacker doesn't write this is an attacker block. You need to, to reason about it. So the algorithm says, pick the largest K cluster. This cluster represents with high probability the set of honest blocks. 
And then you just order the blocks in some order, topological order. You order the blue blocks. And this is the set of honest blocks. And you can um, penalize the rest of the blocks, uh, either discard them or put them late in the order. This is the, this is the generalization of Satoshi's uh, protocol. Again, Satoshi chose the largest, uh, the longest chain, and we choose the largest K cluster. And to see this in more, in a more um, crystal clear way, observe that the longest chain is the largest zero cluster. Okay, so when Satoshi decided that the largest chain, the, lar the longest chain, is the only chain of, that you should maintain, and you should discard the rest, this is essentially, uh, this is essentially reduces to the, picking the largest zero cluster. Whereas we pick in a, in a larger, more rich setup, we, rich, we, we pick the largest K cluster. OK, and there's some theorems um, in the paper um, about how, how to translate Bitcoins, uh, so co to compare Bitcoin security to, to phantom security. What we can see here is that, is that the zero cluster rule of Satoshi is secure under low throughput. When you don't create many, when you block, when you create one block per, per, 10, sec, per 10 minutes, the, the, the largest zero cluster roughly corresponds to the set of honest blocks. And in Phantom, you first select what throughput you want to, to support. This implies what, you, what you, your parameter k is. And then picking the largest k cluster is secure, represents, corresponds roughly to the honest set of blocks. OK. So just uh, an example how, how Phantom will order this DAG. You can, uh, you can uh, verify that I chose here the, the largest two cluster in the DAG. And um, so one option in Phantom is simply to ignore blocks BD, to discard them like Satoshi did, discard the dishonest blocks. That's the uh, default decision if you want to, the easiest way to implement Phantom. But the quite a bit more sophisticated way and more efficient is to, is to incorporate blocks, the red blocks as well, just very late in the order. So we penalize them. Uh, block B, for instance, is very late in the order. It only comes after a blue block H uh, pointed at it. You can see more details in the paper. Um, the, the protocol, as I described it here, um, is, difficult, is computationally difficult to compute. So there's, um, the finding the largest K cluster might be difficult. And so we have a greedy version in the paper. This greedy version is mimicking the conceptual uh, um, uh, reasoning behind Phantom, but is not, is not aiming to approximate it in a formal manner. We're just proving our security properties with respect to the, to the greedy version. OK, so don't mix this with, with an approximation algorithm. OK, so um, what, more in the paper, there's additional discussion about the greedy versions of, this, of, this, of Phantom, about the waiting times. So Phantom has um, less, uh, uh, longer waiting times than our previous protocol specter. On the other hand, it has um, stronger properties. It's a linear order. Um, so you can see this trade off in the paper. And you can see how you can combine specter and phantom together to achieve both uh, the, uh, the good of both worlds. To some extent, there are some trade offs there. Um, and you can see a formal security proof. If you're um, interested in, in these, usually like 5% of the people are interested in, a, in security proof. Uh, at best, and uh, that's probably uh, that's uh, pretty much it. Um, feel free to contact us. We're looking to expand our our um, operations. We're implementing these protocols in DAG Labs, so feel free to reach out. Thank you. Time for questions, or we're done. Two questions. 
Other questions? Do you have any comments on Hashgraph? Um, I don't, okay. but I just want to say that uh, protocols should be classified, uh, or, or blockchain projects should be classified or categorized by uh, inherent assumptions they make, like if they're proof of work, proof of stake, um, um, or like are, are they decentralized or they have centralized entities. I'm not saying anything specific about Hashgraph, but the fact that Hashgraph uses a DAG does not mean it's similar to Spectre or Phantom. They have a, they have a gossip of gossip protocol. It's uh, legitimate to have a different uh, implementations. It's not in the same family. I wouldn't categorize it here. It's just um, very superficial um, uh, similarity. And we should, we should classify things according to really what the assumptions is, how the, the system looks like. Um, hi, I'm Bob McElrath. I'm the Brady hey. blockchain guy. Uh, so I have two comments. One is, uh, so you've defined this parameter k. Um, the parameter k you defined is actually statistical. It's not something you can actually fix in the protocol. In other words, what k is is dependent upon where miners are and their latencies. Um, so I mean, it, it, you can measure it, but it has a mean and it has a standard deviation. Um, and that depends just on the accidental latency. If you define k equals 2 and you have diamonds in your graph, there's a non-trivial probability that you actually have three parallel blocks just, just due to the latency. So what we do is we don't need to have a precise estimation of k. It's OK to take 10 standard deviations above, okay. above it. OK, as long as you're not fixing it in the protocol. It's no, we, just, no like we are fixing it in the protocol. We are fixing it in the protocol. But in advance, we, are taking, we can take several uh, uh, orders of magnitude safety margin. So let, we can take, let's say, the, let's, let's say in healthy conditions, the network's uh, latency is three seconds. We can set k to be 30 seconds, like to, to correspond to 30 seconds okay. in the protocol. So we set it at the Genesis block. This is where we deviate from Spectre paradigm. We set this k in the, at the, in the Genesis block. We decide what the k is. But we could take say, several safety margins. And you can think of it as this is precisely what Satoshi did not do. Right? Satoshi, uh, Satoshi had to. Uh, doesn't have this, has this assumption of 10 minutes, but this, um, this limits the throughput. So in our setup, you sh first decide what the throughput is, let's say 10 blocks per second. You then reason about k. Then you take several safety margins, se several uh, standard deviations, and then you choose that k. And, okay. and the trade-off is you lose waiting time. So if you take too large of a k, it's longer waiting times. OK, I, I claim that's not actually necessary, but let's talk offline. Um, cool. The second comment is that you appear to be uh, deciding upon ordering of transactions topologically. The only reason that the, the longest chain rule works is because it is actually a highest work rule, because the work is constant in each block, and if you add up the work in each block, uh, you end up with the longest chain rule. So the, top, the topology of a DAG is attackable. It's zero cost to change who, who your parents are, right? And so you can change your parents. Oh, you I mean, mean before creating the, the block? At the time you a block, you can before pick who your parents are, right? Before creating the block. Yes, before creating the block, mm -hmm. you pick who your parents are. But that has zero cost, mm -hmm. right? So what we actually need here is a method to combine the work using the, the topological structure. And at the end of that, the output of that should be a total work to a subgraph. Definitely. So the, the Phantom Protocol uses work. It's not, it doesn't use only the, topolo the topology. OK. And if we used only the topology, it, wouldn't, it would be a, a novel, but a, a broken protocol. So Phantom Agreed. is both novel and Good. working. OK. <laughs> Hi, um, sort of piggybacking off of uh, some of the other questions. So it seems as if your uh, protocol makes assumptions about uh, delay on the network. And with the internet having unbounded delay, it seems as if you don't get all the properties that one would want in a DLT protocol, such as um, being able to operate in an asynchronous environment with unbounded also, Satoshi delay. Made, made assumptions. Also, also, Satoshi made assumptions, right? And also with respect to um, having linear ordering along with that, as well as the, the um, integrity of the system of record. So it seems as if you don't have all of those together. Is that a, is that a correct statement? It, it is, but I, I don't okay. know of any blockchain project that don't ha doesn't have it. So Satoshi also has assumptions on the propagation delay in the network, right? And okay. there are some like, uh, impossibility, are. Re impossibility results that you can't assume nothing and a propagation delay. If you assume nothing, you can't arrive at consensus uh, at some setups. Um, but, but either not, way, not in all setups. Not right? in all setups, but yeah. in Bitcoin setup, you assume something, right? Yes. You assume 10 minutes. There are projects that assume uh, much less, 
but then, um, yeah, I guess they trade off other properties. Yeah. OK, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm yeah. um, I think we're up. Uh, we'll take it offline, unless it's a very short question. She's probabilistic long chain consensus as opposed to finality. Uh, and maybe you so this is about orthogonal. This, this is orthogonal to to, the, to phantom. Um, phantom is generalizing Satoshi's paradigm, so therefore we are also probabilistic, and that just probability, probability decays exponentially fast as in Satoshi's uh, system. Uh, why do you make that choice as opposed to? You can do finality, but as it's an orthogonal decision. I mean, you can do finality in Bitcoin as well. Introduce a finality window. You can do in, uh, finality in, in Phantom as well. Just orthogonal decision. Thanks. Thank you.